to Edison Open House Global Healthcare 2021. Now, part of our mission is to help you understand how professional investors view the life sciences sector. And as part of that, we've heard the views of a number of sell side firms as to how they find and select opportunities for investment. And as part of that series, I'm delighted to welcome Nick Moore of Stiefel. Nick is managing director of the healthcare investment banking team. He trained as a doctor before moving on to Morgan Stanley and then to Jefferies. Nick, you're very welcome. But tell us a bit more before we get into the meat of this about Stiefel. Uh, well, thank you very much and delighted to be here. Um, Stiefel is uh, a firm that's been around for 130 years, uh, originally founded in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We have a market cap of about $4 billion. And over the last 20 years, we've really been making a push from our asset management routes into investment banking. And I was very excited to join uh, in early 2018. And over uh, the, the subsequent years, we've been having a, a very uh, strong growth phase in healthcare. And that's been on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think one of the things that we do a little differently to other firms is we run our healthcare business as a globally integrated effort. And that is really being appreciated by corporate clients and um, investors alike, and they, they see the, the joined up nature of, uh, of our thinking, whether it's uh, around financing, capital markets, uh, M&A, or indeed UK corporate broking. What trends are you seeing in healthcare at the moment? So I, I think uh, almost a year into a global pandemic, clearly healthcare has been top of mind for uh, investors for, for quite some time now. And we're seeing a, an even broader range of investors focusing on the sector, including a lot of generalists. Uh, certainly, biopharma uh, remains uh, largely the domain of subsector specialist investors uh, in the United States, particularly in public markets. But I think uh, some of the med tech opportunities and diagnostics opportunities, which are, are more readily understood by uh, generalist investors, are, are seeing broader based demand and interest uh, from, from investors than they have for, for, for many years. And the, the figures are extraordinary. I was just looking at companies involved in diagnostics and COVID-19 treatments with the best performers, which you might expect, up 493% and 475% respectively. Mm -hmm. Small molecule drug development, 286% up. Research tools and data, cell and gene therapies also performed exceptionally well. So, you know, 2020 has been a, a bumper year in many ways. Uh, very much so, very much so. And I think, you know, that is, it, it, it's obviously good news for, for companies, it's good news for investors, but I think more broadly speaking, it's good news for humanity that we've been able to advance, you know, particularly with COVID-19 diagnostic tests so quickly that we've been able to, uh, you know, with the work of uh, companies like AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna and others, to develop vaccines so quickly. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the fastest vaccine before 2020 was developed in about four or five years. To bring that down to, to nine months is, uh, is really quite startling. So I guess that in this year, it's been relatively easy to make a return in this sector. But in, let's say, more normal times, how would you look at uh, an investment, how, what would you think of as an opportunity and how would you start? Sure. So uh, I, I think at, at the end of the day, it, it ultimately, uh, wh whether it's a diagnostic or a therapeutic, it, it really boils down to what, what's the size of the end market? Um, how much of that market do you think that you can, you can gain? And what do you think the pricing for, for that product, uh, whether it's a therapy or a diagnostic, would be? And, you know, th those are all the fundamental drivers of, of valuation. Um, and then, you know, with, with some appropriate assumptions, you can discount that back to, to derive a value of, uh, of the company today. But, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, biotech and um, biopharmaceutical development still remains uh, a, a pretty high-risk uh, enterprise. 
Uh, but I, I think what, what is so exciting is that there are so many uh, investors, particularly in the US, that are willing and able to do the extensive diligence around these opportunities and indeed to allocate significant amounts of capital uh, to advancing those programs. You mentioned pricing there. Is there going to be a crisis of affordability post-COVID? I mean, we've seen health systems all over the world in crisis and economies are in crisis. Do you think that affordability is going to get a, you know, a much bigger spotlight? So I, I think affordability has had a pretty big spotlight for, for quite a few years now. Um, and, you know, it, it used to sort of come uh, sharply into focus on a, on a four-year cycle around U.S. presidential elections. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's increasingly a topic that, that people are thinking through. But, you know, just to uh, give, give you one example, um, you know, one of the things that's resonating very strongly with investors now is the health economic um, advantages. In other words, the cost savings from a new diagnostic or a new therapeutic. And, you know, one of uh, my clients, one of Stiefel's clients that we've worked with very closely for a number of years um, is a company called Renalytics. So this was some um, intellectual property spun out of Mount Sinai in New York. The company listed on the AIM market here in the UK uh, back in 2018. We helped them do a very successful follow on in London in the summer of 2019. And then uh, I, we were incredibly excited to dual list the company on NASDAQ last summer, raising $85 million. That was really the first significant pre-revenue diagnostics IPO in the US for over a decade. And one of the reasons for that was the, the highly compelling health economic argument around their diagnostic, which in short is uh, an early AI-enabled diagnostic for diabetic kidney disease. And by testing people early and, and identifying those problems early, it actually allows health systems to make dramatic cost savings over a three to five year horizon, even accounting for, for the cost of the test. I mean, there's a big trend towards value-based uh, pricing, but where do uh, governments and regulatory authorities and health systems sit when it comes to cures? Because I think, or I suspect there may be a bit of a fight about how much value a cure has and particularly of course that's true of cell and gene therapies uh in, indeed and uh you know some uh sort of slightly cynical industry commentators have uh, have sort of uh observed that you know maybe uh, pharmaceutical companies don't don't want to, to cure diseases at all, that they actually want to turn everything into a chronic condition, because then you have that recurring revenue model. Uh, and that's something that, that, that large uh, corporations are familiar with and, and, uh, and, and understand. Now, of course, uh, I, I, I don't actually share that slightly cynical point of view myself. But, it, it, you know, it's been brought into sharp focus with gene therapies in particular, where, you know, th this is, um, to all intents and purposes, uh, a, a, a cure. Uh, you know, if you go in and, and you fix a, a deficient, defective or, or indeed missing gene. Uh, now, obviously, the, um, the, uh, the durability uh, of that response, in other words, sort of how long that quote unquote cure lasts for, uh, it varies um, and, you know, needs following up um, after patients are treated. Uh, and I, I think will uh, actually be one of the, the key factors that will actually enable payers to, to make some of those, those reimbursements um, more manageable. So, you know, you will probably get, you know, stage payments over a number of years, uh, you know, and, and that, that the payment in year three only comes in if the patient, you know, is still cured, uh, quote unquote, in year three. Nick, we've seen, as we've mentioned, that 2020 has really put the life sciences sector in the spotlight, and that's brought lots of good things. You know, it's raised the profile. Uh, it's it's really brought a lot of money into the sector and investment. But has it also been a hindrance, and has it, you know, somehow altered investment op opportunities? 
Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I think clearly um, companies that have been conducting clinical trials uh, have been particularly affected. You know, um, some of the oncology trials in particular where, you know, patients who by definition, um, because of their, their cancer, have a degree of immunosuppression. You know, people have not wanted to bring them in to, uh, to hospitals where they could catch uh, COVID or be exposed. And, you know, if you're, uh, if you're trialing a, a, an oncology drug, you know, th those trials have either oftentimes been, been delayed or, uh, or, or even postponed indefinitely. But I think, um, you know, that that's sort of the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin that we've seen is that regulators have really gone out of their way to try to help companies keep trials on track. And, um, for example, another company that I work with very closely called Kaliditas, based in Sweden, which Stiefel listed on the Swedish exchange in 2018, and then dual listed uh, on NASDAQ in the early summer last year. Um, their uh, discussions with the FDA about their ongoing phase three trial were extremely productive. Now, they have a, a very uh, attractive therapy for a, a, a rare kidney disease called IgA nephropathy, uh, which can be taken by mouth. And the, uh, the FDA in, in the US in particular really went out of their way to work with Renee, the CEO, and the whole team at Kaliditas to keep that trial on track. It helped that the drug could be mailed out to patients and they could take it orally at home. It was not a, an IV infusion that they had to come into a care facility to receive. And the FDA were, were very flexible about, you know, if, if the company company couldn't get patients back at, you know, exactly, you know, the, the six month point for, for a certain piece of follow up or nine months uh, or, or wherever it was in the, uh, the relevant part of the trial. Uh, they were being quite flexible about uh, allowing uh, the company to, you know, extend that by a few weeks, but, you know, keeping within the, the overall trial design. So I, I think, you know, everybody um, uh, overall ha has really tried to go out of their way in exceptional circumstances. And, you know, I, I think, you know, again, a, a, a cynic would say that regulators, uh, be they financial or, or medical, are, are not known for, for their flexibility. But I, I think we certainly saw some very pragmatic, helpful um, uh, decisions and discussions going on with regulators last year. Yes, and you might say that actually people would say, well, if you can do it for COVID and you can be, you've proved you can be flexible and you can be quick. So there's no going back, I suspect, for some of the regulators. But just staying on, on COVID a, a, a moment longer, you've seen quite a lot of companies pivot to COVID. And of course, it isn't going to last uh, forever. You know, we we are all hoping that we'll we'll see an end of it. You know, not altogether, but in a, in say a, a year or so. What are the prospects for those companies that have really moved all those eggs into the uh, the COVID basket? Yeah, uh, look, I, I think some some companies have. Um, as you say, moved all their eggs into the COVID basket. I, I think that's a relatively small number, uh, actually. Um, but I, I think the way I think about it is is in three categories. There are um, the vaccine producers, so you know, be that Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, AstraZeneca. Um, there are the diagnostics companies. And then there are the therapeutics companies, so people that are actually trying to, you know, um, produce a compound that, that will help people with COVID. I think the general buy side consensus is probably that the, the companies that are most exposed are those producing therapeutics, because, you know, as the as vaccine rollout extends, particularly to the most vulnerable categories uh, of people first, I, I think, you know, the, the, there's probably, you know, to use a technical term, the, the probably the, the highest beta, uh, you know, the, the people that are most geared to sort of a negative downside reaction around sentiment or for a public company share price uh, are those um, companies focused on, on COVID therapeutics. But I, I think broadly, the, um, the, the vaccine companies and, and the diagnostics companies, um, you know, have a, a real, you know, um, medium term opportunity here. I, I think in particular, 
um, the market is probably underappreciating the the continued need for for diagnostics going forward. I think uh, as the as the vaccine news flow and, uh, and regulatory approvals and commercial rollout and ramp up of national vaccination campaigns have come through over the last several months. The, the public diagnostics companies have seen, you know, pretty material downward re-rating in their share price. I, I think, personally, that feels like a little bit of an overreaction to me. I, I think the, the diagnostic landscape is, is going to see continued volume, continued demand. Um, and, you know, we, we live in a, a pretty risk-averse world now. And, and, you know, we've seen that, um, uh, you know, with uh, the, the way lockdowns were imposed last year. I, I, I don't think anybody doubted you could impose a lockdown in, in China. Um, but uh, then all of a sudden, you know, people didn't really think it was going to work in Italy, and it did. And, and it's worked across the, the whole of the Western world. So I, I think people, society now is pretty risk intolerant in general. And I think, you know, the need for de-risking, you know, whether it's going to a concert, go, going on a plane, um, uh, you know, in any uh, venue where large numbers of people are, are, are crowded together, uh, I, I think whether people have a vaccine uh, certificate or not, I, I think there's still going to be a, a demand for, for testing there uh, into the medium term. Mm. To what extent do you think has the pool of capital increased for life sciences investment? Is it just the same pool? It's kind of just shifting around a bit or is there new money coming into this? Yeah, so I, I guess um, I, I'd say a, a couple of things there. I mean, broadly, the the pool for healthcare is is very weighted to the U.S. Um, and you know, so many of those funds have made such big returns over so many years that not not only have those fund sizes grown, um, which you know, off investment returns, which is one strategy, uh, one, one, one theme, if you like, in terms of why the pool of capital is increasing. Um, there's been a, a lot of m a in the sector. So, you know, these um, smaller um, biotech companies continue to get bought for, um, you know, significant valuations. And, you know, just uh, um, earlier in January uh, 2021, we saw Sanofi acquire uh, Kimab up in Cambridge for, uh, you know, $1.1 billion up front with another $350 million of milestones in the future. So, you know, significant amounts of, of cash being being deployed, which ultimately goes back into the hands of the investors backing these companies. And, and then thirdly, um, you know, success breeds success. And as these investors have made consistent big returns for their underlying investors, you know, be it, you know, institutions or pension funds, um, those um, underlying investors have in turn continued to allocate more capital to healthcare. So I think, you know, the, um, the amount of capital available is um, probably at an all-time high, whether you're looking private markets or public markets for, for healthcare, which I, I think is, is very, very helpful um, uh, for companies, um, but ultimately for patients. As you've indicated, the UK capital markets were really busy in the first three quarters or so of 2020. Um, and there were a lot of secondary placings, but there were less IPOs. Do you think 2021 will continue that theme or will be different? It's really interesting. And, you know, last year in UK capital markets in, in 2020, I, I think there were sort of uh, two types of, of, of um, follow on uh, raises, if you like. There were sort of the, uh, you know, uh, shoring up balance sheets that were becoming stretched. Um, fortunately, mostly not healthcare companies, right? So, you know, this is sort of hospitality, leisure, retail, uh, real estate, um, in particularly sectors exposed to uh, to, to retail and um, an office uh, real estate. Um, 
and uh, then you know you had the the sort of uh, for want of a better word the, the front foot placings you know the healthcare companies going out and, and tapping uh, the markets and, and raising money you know whether that's uh, you know companies like um, uh, Kalitas and, and Renalytics raising money uh, in the US uh, and bringing that capital back to Europe uh, and the UK um, or you know it's companies um, like uh, you know one of my other clients company split between um, Weatherby up in, in Yorkshire and Cambridge called Avacta, who raised a lot of money um, uh, in order to uh, to move forward with their, their COVID diagnostic tests last year. Um, Synergen, again, out of the University of Southampton, raised a lot of money for their COVID uh, therapeutic, where they had some really, really exciting data last year. I think the theme uh, is going to change a little bit in, in 2021. And, uh, you know, obviously a, an IPO takes four to six months to prepare for in general, whereas, you know, if a company is public already, you're talking, you know, may, maybe as little as one, one, two, three weeks to prepare a follow on offering. So there's just a lead time factor there. But certainly looking at my pipeline, and I can't give you any names yet, but we're seeing a lot of um, private companies in the healthcare space now wanting to list on the UK market. Um, and, you know, healthcare IPOs in the UK, that's been a, a pretty quiet space for, for quite some years. So I, I'm seeing that as a, you know, really quite a, um, a significant uh, change um, and, and indeed a very positive one. That's very interesting you say that because you've already indicated that, Stiefel, one of the things that you're an integrated, you think about, you know, the global uh, healthcare uh, economy rather than uh, just uh, the US or the UK or, or, or Europe. And uh, do you think it will go the other way as well, that, you know, European companies will go to uh, for US listings? So I, I think the the way we think about this at Stiefel, and and you're you're absolutely right in terms of how we have this globally integrated effort you know we we don't think about um oh this is nick's client in london therefore you know the us team shouldn't get involved or this is mark's client in new york therefore nick shouldn't get involved because he sits in london it's very much about building high quality trusted relationships with those corporate clients and then finding them the best uh, group of investors for their stage of investment um, as they go through that corporate life cycle. And, you know, one of the reasons that Renalytics listed here in the UK back in 2018 was um, public market investors in, in the US were just not ready to, to provide that kind of risk capital um, to, for them to go public in 2018. And even when we dual listed them on uh, back on NASDAQ, last year it was still at a relatively early stage for for the u.s capital market so you know there you i think that's a, a perfect case study for how stiefel looks to work with companies you have some intellectual properties spinning out of mount sinai in new york you have a management team of american nationals split between uh, new york uh, state and utah in the u.s uh, you have backing from EKF, uh, a company based in Wales, listed on AIM, uh, and some uh, very thoughtful UK uh, investors uh, backing that company to list on, on AIM. And then uh, we take that company that's come with, with that trajectory back to the NASDAQ market and do a dual listing at the appropriate stage to raise a really significant amount of capital as that company rolls through their, their um, regulatory um, process. They're now on file with the FDA awaiting approval. They've been very successful building traction with, uh, with Medicare and payers in the US in particular. So, you know, what we did there was we, we came up with a bespoke capital market strategy that suited the company. And, you know, we, we sometimes see uh, other banks think, a little bit about it the other way around. Rather than putting the company first, they sort of put their own internal structures first. And, and you know, I, I think we've been able to, to compete against that approach very successfully by actually putting our companies uh, and, and our clients first. And do you see that uh, cross-jurisdictional flow of investment becoming ever more apparent as we go through 2021? Definitely. And, you know, 
uh, frankly, off the back of the, the Renalytics uh, success that we've had, we're now seeing quite a lot of other private companies in the US that are not ready to go to NASDAQ. Um, approaching uh, myself and my colleagues here in London at Steve for saying, well, actually, you know, we, we could raise some private VC money in London, but we saw that Renalytics actually listed on AIM and, and were able to deliver a much lower cost of capital for that initial investment. Do you think that, that we could be appropriate for, for that path as well? And, you know, we're, we're assessing a number of those opportunities at the moment. And, you know, we're doing that really in partnership with, um, with public market investors here in the UK. We're, we're taking a number of these private companies around uh, on confidential roadshows with uh, a very select group of UK institutional public markets investors getting uh, to know the company, building the, building the relationship, hearing the story, and doing uh, essentially you know, some early look investor meetings. And uh, so far, the feedback is, is very constructive. Now, SPAC, uh, special purpose acquisition companies, have taken up a lot of attention in the past few months. Is this a trend that you expect to continue? And what are the pros and cons of European life sciences companies considering that particular avenue? Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's a fascinating question. And I was wondering actually how long into this uh, discussion we were going to get before the topic came up because- uh, They are quite risky. Even, well, even 12 months ago, um, they, it was a, a, a quite a, a nerdy, esoteric uh, and rare corner uh, of investment banking, the uh, the SPAC universe. Uh, I, I would say it's probably still uh, nerdy and esoteric, but it, it's anything but rare. And in fact, in um, the US public markets in September last year, uh, more than 50% of the capital that was raised in IPOs was actually raised in SPAC IPOs. So in short, um, that special purpose acquisition companies, um, and they come with um, a, a, essentially a, a group of um, pre-packed anchor investors, um, you know, usually a, a validating name in the healthcare space. Um, it, it's not just combined to the healthcare sector. There, there are SPACs in, in, in of every flavor across every stripe of uh, industry um, listing in the US now. And uh, essentially, it, it's another uh, way to go public in, in the US. So, you know, historically, particularly for healthcare companies, there, there were two ways to go public in the US. You could either do a regular way IPO or you could do a reverse merger with, uh, you know, a company that um, effectively was a cash shell. You know, maybe all their, um, all their drug candidates had failed trials. They had a listing and a small cash balance. And uh, essentially through, a mer through this so-called reverse merger, they, they were selling their listing to a private company. And that always had a slightly um, mixed reputation um, with, I think, with all market participants, but most importantly, with, with investors in the US. And um, the, the SPAC route is significantly different to that reverse merger, although technically and legally there are some similarities. The key difference is it's a clean vehicle. It's a newly incorporated vehicle that's been IPO'd. Um, so, you know, you don't have to worry about sort of skeletons in the closet, if you like. Um, and it comes with um, uh, a, a concept called a pipe. So um, that, that's a, a, essentially a, an equity placing that takes place to new investors as well as, well as the current SPAC investors when that, um, that merger completes. So effectively, you're, uh, you're pre-baking um, the, the, the crossover round that comes ahead of a typical healthcare IPO in the US, that last private round where you target a lot of public market investors and the IPO itself, that, that all comes together in, in uh, a couple of steps, uh, the, the merger and the, the so-called pipe, the equity raise, that, that all happen at the same time with the, with the SPAC route. Risky, highly risky, where would you place it on that scale? Uh, 
I, I think there, there's, there's a lot of competition um, a, around those vehicles. So, um, you know, whereas if you're going down the IPO route, you, you have sort of, you know, you, you're probably a little bit more master of your own destiny subject to attracting investor demand. Whereas, you know, you, you could um, be courting a, a, a SPAC that uh, then decides it actually wants to merge with, with another company. So I guess there's you know, potentially a, a little bit more downside risk that, you know, you could lose the vehicle that, that you want to, to do the deal with at the last minute. Um, but I, I don't think it, it's any more or less um, uh, risk. I, I don't really think about it in terms of risk. I, I, the, the one key difference versus an IPO um, that I, I think it works really well for is companies that, for whatever reason, maybe don't make the best IPO candidate in the world, but they still make a really good public company. So it, it actually de-risks the, the route to public markets for those companies. Nick, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I wanted to close with your thoughts about 2021. I mean, 2020 has been a, a dreadful year for in, in so many ways for so many uh, people. I mean, the life sciences sector we've said has, you know, performed magnificently uh, despite it. But I wondered where you thought the particular opportunities were in 2021 as we hopefully move out of the pandemic. Which particular sectors would you tip within the life sciences sector for 2021? Sure. Well, let, let me uh, start that uh, that answer off by saying that I am um, one of the world's great optimists. I, I don't think you can work in, in the biopharma sector uh, and indeed uh, in equity capital markets specifically around uh, healthcare and biotech without being an optimist. And I think that the lesson of 2020 is um, that you get rewarded for optimism in, in this sector. Now, you know, I'm not saying you should, you should throw money around without thinking, you know, clearly uh, you need to do diligence and, and, and understand fully the, the, the different investment opportunities that are out there before you deploy capital. But I, I think I, I would sort of come back to, to the themes that, that we've touched on in a few of the other questions. I think the, the, uh, the longevity of demand around diagnostics, particularly for COVID, um, is, uh, is, is ahead of where certainly public market investors think it's going to be. I think you know the demand for vaccines is going to continue, particularly if this virus continues to mutate and we actually have to tweak the vir uh, the, the vaccine. Um, you know, some commentators are saying, well, actually, you know, the COVID may um, uh, turn into you know a chronic disease that just hangs around forever, and you know there are mutations each year, and it, it almost becomes like a, a flu jab that you actually need a COVID jab every autumn or fall as well. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure we've got enough understanding of the virus to say that that's a likely outcome yet, but it's, it's clearly on the spectrum of possible outcomes. So I, I, I think the, uh, the opportunity around COVID is probably going to have a, more of a longevity than, than investors generally think it's going to have. Uh, and then look more broadly across healthcare, I think, you know, clearly as vaccine uh, uptake and rollout uh, increases, we are going to see some, some normalization of, of trends in terms of, you know, what goes on in hospitals, um, you know, just not the, um, the, the overwhelming uh, demand for, for COVID treatment which will allow clinical trials that have been put on hold to get back underway uh, and people to move forward with, um, with, with other um, uh, clinical candidates. And of course, the vaccines have shown us the spectacular promise of messenger RNA. Exactly. And, you know, look, I, I think if you uh, if you look at what our friends at, um, at BioNTech have uh, have done, I mean, that, that that is truly extraordinary. Right. Um, and actually just to, you know, bring such a novel uh, vaccine therapy forward, uh, like BioNTech have done, like Moderna have done indeed as well um, so quickly, uh, you know, really highlights um, the uh, the applicability of that to uh, you know what is without question now a global humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, you know I, I think I read over the weekend there have now been over two million deaths uh, from COVID since the start of the pandemic on on a global basis, and 
the other point, you know, just picking up on, on a, a remark I, I made a moment ago, of course, the, the beauty of the mRNA approach, of course, is if the virus mutates, you know, you, you can go in and, uh, you know, just, just tweak the, that, that, uh, that mRNA message. You know, you change a few letters, you change a, f a, few, um, a few bases there in, 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 in the message. So, you know, it's, um, uh, I, I, I hesitate to use the, the, the Twitter analogy, but, you know, in your, in your 140 characters, you know, you can, you can go in and, and backspace and, and back up and delete and, and you know, insert a, a few different letters to, to give you a, 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 highly, uh, a highly precise adjusted code if that virus uh, indeed mutates. Nick, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. And actually, I think in summary, one might say that the life sciences have really proved themselves in a spectacular way this year. And it makes us all proud to be associated with them. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking.